everyone welcome to day 3 of the conference i am super excited that we've been going through this awesome journey of a four day conference i really hope you guys enjoyed the last two days of the conference i really hope you found the uh, the content insightful and uh, as i mentioned all of this is recorded all of uh, the content that the speakers are sharing will be shared with you all those uh, powerpoint presentations and the notebooks will be shared with you so you don't have to worry if you are not able to attend live uh one of the other things is that as we did yesterday and day before we will be having a trivia quiz that's going to be uh, at around like 9 am like between both the sessions so uh please make sure you tune in for that if you are looking uh, at this conference from youtube please make sure you're coming back on uh, linkedin and viewing it live because uh, the trivia for the trivia contest we will be expecting your answers on the uh, on the linkedin platform that's how i can connect with you so awesome uh, i am really excited for both the sessions today we have a awesome lineup of speakers and um, without like uh, without much ado we can get started and one more quick update is that if you have questions during the presentation please do put that in the comment section the speakers will be taking uh, pauses during the presentation so that they can answer your questions rather than pushing them through the end of the presentation so please put in your questions as and when you get it when when you're going through the presentation please do put them in the comment section so awesome let's have anirudh on the stage Hi Anirudh, how's it how's going? It going? <laughs> awesome. Uh, good morning and happy Wednesday. Uh, it's really, really nice to have you here. I'm excited. Uh, I mean, the last two days have been fun, and I think we'll just continue the journey in the next three. Yeah, next next two days, today and tomorrow, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and the rest day, you know. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, so Anirudh, uh, as you might um, as you might already know him, uh, he is an AI scientist in Pinterest, and he has a lot of research interests. So he's also part of uh, what was called as NASA's Frontier Development Lab. He is the machine learning lead and faculty there. So uh, he's also been involved in uh, coaching the teams, and he's been the founder of CMU's Robo Race Autonomous Racing uh, Championship. So uh, it's it's. a pleasure to have you here anirudh i am very excited to actually hear a little more about your work if you could share that with the audience and then we can jump into the presentation excellent uh, i'm glad to be here today and sharing some fun journey that we saw while working with nasa on a problem that we thought was hard to solve and we'll see why and then going towards in the direction of deployment and not just like ending up at a research paper So uh, I'm going to get started with what the problem really is, what we are going to discuss, and this is awesome. worldview search. Awesome. All right. So, so the search problem uh, that we are going to discuss is actually a problem that you might have already played as a kid. Uh, the Where's Waldo problem. There's this gigantic maze uh, of many, many interesting characters, and your job is to find where is Waldo. and uh, i'll be honest i haven't found it him yet uh, and that's the challenge to solve and i think many of you are you know working in object detection would think like yeah we'll build a model train it against waldo and start working on it what if you actually had this one image of waldo and you're then trying to build and find waldo in this gigantic image it's a hard thing right and that's exactly the problem that we are trying to search on remote sensing satellite images for scientists so let's say if you were a scientist excited about you know working in climate science let's say you're working on you know wildfires so what would you do is you'd go to this satellite imagery store uh, it's called worldview search you would go there and take a selfie of the earth right from the top like this then you would go and find another example of a wildfire and take another one of these photographs so now we have two training examples excellent so you know you need a few thousand of them to get started with you know doing your studies so you go and find a third example uh, it's not i think we just got lucky before i'm not even sure if this is a cloud or a wildfire but just let's claim for now this is a wildfire and you now go and start searching for the fourth 
scientists have who need to work on problems actually have to do this on many days because uh, this problem is gigantic you see the we are searching just through california and then going portland and a little bit but the earth is 196 uh, 197 million square miles and this is just a single day we have the imagery for 365 days multiplied by 20 that imagery is over 40 petabytes now and by 2025 this will be reaching 250 petabytes the scale is just ginormous and that's where the scientists have to go and find the images which are unlabeled to begin their study to do something with it so that's like the key problem and it's kind of like finding a needle in a haystack you can find this problem the same as you know you're searching for remote sensing or whether you're trying to find celestial bodies it is uh a little tricky to do that manually and in fact many phd's have to spend their mornings trying to find these uh, images for their work that they are about to start so what what makes this problem hard uh, apart from all this manual effort if you want to go through an ai way first part is this is ultra large scale enormous i already said that starts the fun because we don't have any labels you know in in deep learning uh if you train a model let's say a classifier the embeddings will be meaningful they'll come up with a meaningful representation of images that's what the model does and the property is that similar conceptual items will be similar based on these embeddings we don't have labels to train with so how would you even go about doing that that makes the problem more trickier third problem is multi concept So when you work on ImageNet, you know you have one class: a cat, a dog, a tiger, uh, an umbrella. But here you might have a hurricane, an ocean, a desert, all three in the same image, and these are multiple concepts that you know every image has. This makes the problem harder. And finally, uh, it is extremely imbalanced. The the chance of having a hurricane would be 0.00001 whereas the probability of having an ocean in that image or water body is like 71% and uh, in machine learning when things are imbalanced it's not good for life we know that and that's what makes these problems hard so when we started it was sort of a moonshot goal if we can attempt to approach this problem and do something meaningful with that but i'm not going to blab about it i'm just going to show you the demo cuz that's why i'm here right so here's one example of uh, let's say you know you are an atmospheric scientist interested in this particular fluffy cloud pattern which has a scientific name i don't know that i'm not the scientist so we go in try to take an example of that and nice it gives us back somewhere similar looking examples structurally similar i think that's the word i'm going to say So maybe we'll go a little bit south of it and find one side which is dense and the other side which is sparse, and we start to get similar examples. Again, there is not a single label we have used to train the system. That's the point. So another example, maybe you know we are have been stuck for two years, haven't taken any vacations, and if you know any nice spots with beaches, maybe that's where you want to take the vacation. So we'll try to do a little vacation spotting with this area of coral reefs. um and uh, let's see what kind of things we get back all right we get other spots you know similar blue patterns nice lush greenery uh so we are able to retrieve that and takes like about a second maybe for the system to work at scale so job well done baldo can be found uh i have one example which actually makes me really which makes it seem really impressive So here's an example we know the area where ships usually get stuck thanks evergreen uh and you search for this desert ocean desert sandwich it gives you back the same you know examples where there's a desert ocean desert and this is very impressive you know why because if you're training a classifier you would say uh there is a desert in this image and there's an ocean in this image and that's the data you would give it right and you will have to supply uh these classes here without any labels it figured out that it's a desert ocean desert with a classifier it will give you items which have both of them but can't guarantee it will give the structure 
we are able to get the structure back and that's actually one of the impressive parts of the whole system and the demo works so now what we'll do in the rest of the presentation is start digging into uh, the pipeline the process of how we built it and the people behind it and to do that you know it's always good to start with a theory and theory is actually very simple believe it or not it's the area of self supervised learning so self supervised learning uh, caught uh, you know its momentum in 2020 onwards uh, and a lot of uh, impressive achievements have been made since 2020 and we are you know in that same goal because we started early in 2020 here so an example is uh, you know when we are training a supervised classifier you have an image on the left side and you have the labels ocean coastal fog and forest problem is we are out of stock of any of these labels so what do we do so here's an idea what if we take the image on the left hand side and then rotate it in a random degrees from 0 to 360 degrees the image on the left hand side and right hand side to you and me is exactly the same image it just rotated so conceptually it's the same image so let's make that. Let's make another image. And what we do is we take the left image and crop it slightly, right? So again, conceptually the same image. We take a note of that. Let's maybe apply some color digital, you know, the augmentation you normally apply while training networks. So if you take an image on the left-hand side, apply a few transformations and come up with the right-hand side, it's same image. Let's feed it to a network and let the network figure out why these are similar. Let the network do the job so we don't have to, you know, it's more smarter than us. And if you can teach it that these networks, these images are the same, it will then start to generate similar embeddings for similar objects. So back in uh, 2020, Google published a paper uh, called SimCLR, which was like a big boost in this direction of uh, self-supervised learning. And to show an example of Earth, uh, here's a hurricane. So we take a hurricane and generate two augmented versions of it. We take uh, ocean and desert uh, and generate two augmentations of it. Now the network figures out on the left-hand side that it needs to train it in a way that the two hurricanes are, at, are basically closer in the embedding space. Similarly, the desert oceans are closer in the embedding space, but then the deserts, ocean, and the hurricane are further apart. And that's what happens when you start feeding it millions of examples. One of the cool things with self-supervised learning is that you just need to feed it data and it will train a model for you that can generate these embeddings. But now starts the cool part. If you had labeled examples, but you only had a few, you could train a supervised classifier with much, much lesser amount of data because the network is already intelligent enough to generally understand the world of how to convert images to meaningful representations and think of it as you are either fine you know transfer learning or fine tuning it with only a few examples so you get the best of world, both worlds with lesser label data and a large amount of uh, all data so i'm going to get into uh, the pipeline part of it but i'm just going to pause for a minute in case there are any high level questions uh yeah yes um so few of the i think one of the questions that came up is about like explainability or like fairness uh fairness parts uh how do we make sure like is that something that comes into concern when we are looking at uh space machine learnings or like you know looking at such uh satellite imagery and if so how do we handle that totally uh i think bias which is like the crux of things at the end of the day happens in no matter which AI problem you are working on. In fact, if you don't think about it before modeling it, uh, that's the opportunity learned. Uh, we identified the opportunity about the imbalance in the data sets. So it might happen that some of the big majority often occurring classes will be trained well, and mm -hmm. those lower uh, occurring rare phenomenons will not. And our problem essentially was the rare phenomenon that we need to find. So we kind of went the extreme way of like trying to pick the uh, uh, those biases need to be balanced, and I'll I'll share some learnings on that. Uh, but but great point, and uh, definitely look out for whichever problem you work on. Yeah. 
Awesome. Uh, I think yeah, I would like let this question like uh, come to you uh, for for clarification. So somebody is trying to understand what's the difference between self supervised learning and semi supervised learning. Yeah, um, I'm gonna be bad at this, but I'll I'll, I'll uh, give it a try. So uh, I think there are like three levels you can go. You start with supervised learning completely, which is like you just have purely labeled data. Semi-supervised learning has been for a while. Uh, in some ways, I used to use it in traditional machine learning problems is take a bunch of data uh, labeled, train uh, a system with it, and then start to find uh, you know, other examples that it's un not confident about and try to add that. Uh, it's Sadly, it's, I realize it's also active learning. That's the better name for it. Mm -hmm. But uh, essentially, you're growing with labels uh, and even though you need a lesser number of labels. And then when you grow with it, uh, you can get a lot more performance from your classifiers even with lesser labels, but that's because you are growing with it. In self-supervised, I think the idea is the word self, which is like your data is the label for itself. Mm -hmm. So the label is, you're trying to figure out how you can figure out a methodology to, to extract meaningful similarity from your own data set. So a good example of this is mm -hmm. in natural language processing. Mm -hmm. When Jacob Devlin and team at Google in 2018 worked on BERT, the, the cool part of that is that you, know, you have a sentence mm -hmm. and you're trying to predict two problems. One is that, hey, I just removed a word, which word is it? So you're technically using a word inside the sentence as a label, uh, and that's like one good example of a label. Another example is, okay, is this sentence going to be the next sentence after it? And you're trying to predict that. So it starts to make some meaningful reasoning out of it. But there yeah. was no label to begin with. Uh, I think that's where the NLP world has been slightly further away than uh, the computer vision world. Uh, and in our example in computer vision, we are using the image as its own uh, label in a way. Makes sense. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, so there's one more question. Um, how does the uh, mapping, oh, wait, let me just read through this. Okay, so Manish is asking that, how do you map the augmented images with the original images so that the model can understand the similarities between those images? I'm not, not sure. Um, so one one good example of it, I, I really like to think of uh, many training problems as like, maybe how would you model the problem and find an example that is already out there. So uh, Siamese networks are really a great example. Uh, you know, you have, uh, let's say two signatures that you want to compare and say that is the same signature in the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, so Siamese network is, you know, doing something similar or triplet loss. Uh, where uh, you take uh, uh, two examples, which are usually different, mm -hmm. uh, but same. So two signatures, you know, made by the same person, but essentially you try to teach the network that these are the same examples. In this example, what we the only difference we did is that we just took the same image to convert two examples instead of like having real world uh, data uh, along with it. Got it, got it, got it. That totally makes sense. Uh, now, adding to the to like how you explain like NLP as an example of self supervised learning, I was just I was just uh, about to say that you know uh, we were about to get a follow up question there about what's the what's how is this different from clustering or like unsupervised learning? Yeah, so um, think about this: if you wanted to do clustering, you need to convert the data into some meaningful dimensions, right? That's what AI models do, right? Like somehow they have learned the meaningful representation so they can put it in a world where you can cluster it. If this was a CSV file, you know, with the tabular data, uh, you know, with numbers, we can play and do the clustering. These are images. Yeah. Like, what do you do with these images? Am I going to look at the color and the pixels and then cluster? People have done it. Just to be clear, you're absolutely right. Uh, but, you know, we live in 2022 now, so I think we can do slightly better. Uh, <laughs> And as I will show a few examples, I think that's that's a good segue to see some of the examples to see like we did this, this happened. Wow. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense, totally makes sense. So we're gonna continue with this section, and uh, 
as and when you guys are having any questions, please feel free to put that on the chat and we'll again be taking a pause to answer your questions. Awesome. I'm, thanks. I'm, I'm loving the questions. I didn't realize we were to see, but now I know exactly who's yeah. asking the question. So thanks everyone. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Alrighty. So, uh, so we are now going to talk about, we talked about a theory, we talked about the problem to solve, we saw a demo. Now we'll talk about actually building it. So one of the key reasons to even go about this whole process was in NASA's world, there is uh, standards of impact. So when you deploy something to a spacecraft, that's called technology readiness level nine, okay? And uh, when you publish a paper with a great output, it's technology readiness level three, TRL three. So one to nine scale. I think like getting to level three is great. Uh, you know, you get some kudos, but I think at the end of the day, the question is that how can you get more impact? And we wanted to go in a world where we can get closer and as high on the scale uh, so that we can have an impact on actual scientists who are studying climate change. And what that essentially means is you need to have tools that people can use. So in the next few slides, what you will notice is this theme of open source, the theme of modular components, the theme of reducing the requirement for somebody to use this tool with no knowledge of AI, with no speciality in AI, and quite possibly no knowledge of Python programming. Because we want people who are from any walk of life and interested in climate change to be able to use these tools, or if you're in computer vision, use these tools. So uh, you'll notice that many of these tools can be run with a single line command with no AI, with no programming requirements. And hopefully in your own journey, you start building tools which can be used with, you know, as easy as possible. Righty. So how do we go from start to end? Uh, so our goal is essentially that we give you one image example and you, are, you end up somehow at the end of the day with a catalog quality data set, an exhaustive data set of all possible images, right? So from one image, we want all possible images and that's the journey we want to do. So how would it work from start to end? So we will a pipeline. We divide and conquer by building these sub-speciality tools and then take it through. Uh, so each of these green boxes that you see is built by like one team and then we combine this in some way. And each one of these green two is becomes like a GitHub tool. So let's, uh, I'll take you through from left to right and uh, from, uh, let me see something got hidden. Give me, yeah, give me, a second, something got hidden. <laughs> One sec. All right, all good, no worries. No worries at all. In the meanwhile, um, in the meanwhile, what we can do is uh, people, um, I, I think we, we had a few questions about trivia. Yes, we are going to be having the trivia, but after the session. So please, please uh, wait till that time. And uh, yes, we do have the book again uh, for you guys to uh, for you guys to have. Like uh, we'll be doing the book giveaway with the trivia. So please make sure that you are tuning in from LinkedIn and not YouTube because uh, otherwise I cannot find your profile. So make sure you're tuned in from LinkedIn. Awesome. Um, I'm back. Okay, awesome. Uh, Anirudh, I don't think your screen is shared. Can you check? Awesome. Can you check if your screen is shared? Yes. Yeah, we have it here, yeah. All righty. All right. So, uh, so starting off the uh, game, uh, we have NASA Gibbs, which is this satellite imagery data set. It has 40 petabytes of data. And we want to... Uh, download the data. Many of the folks don't know the meaning of the word API and how we can download it at large scale. So what we did is we built this tool called Gibbs Downloader. It's essentially this fast and easy way where you write a single line of command and you can download data set. For example, in this example, you write Gibbs Downloader, the start and end date, the bottom and right coordinates, and uh, it just downloads the data on your disk. Even better, so you didn't need to you know, learn about all the behind the scene details of how to go about downloading the satellite data sets. It makes life easy, but it does better things. So this is the simplest example, but it also generates files in like TF records. So if you wanted to, let's say, have high performance GPU training, 
it generates the data sets in that particular manner. Uh, well, we also have these options like minus minus animate. So uh, you can, uh, you know, take, uh, you know, videos of Earth, like in this case, the California wildfires from last two years back and uh, publish it on TikTok or Facebook. Uh, but we thought we can also do, uh, uh, we also realized many folks don't yet know what products they need for training. Uh, there are about 897 different satellite products available, and most folks don't know which data set to go to. And that became like a cumbersome thing for people to find and realize where to go to, uh, searching through that many levels. So we said, you know what we'll do? Uh, we'll uh, build the Google of NASA data sets. So you go in, you, you know, write a particular keyword, it searches for it and gives you back uh, the required data set. I think the point is like, if you're building something for a customer and if you're customer focused, build something that would have immense useful value to them. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that was like something with which we could get a lot of customers happy. Then now that you have the data, uh, it's dumped in a directory, in a folder. So the next tool we built is the self-supervised trainer. All it does is it takes your folder of images. So the top command here, all you supplies is the folder of images. That's it. That's literally it. Python train and the folder, and it trains a model for you. Behind the scenes, it takes care of whatever is needed, whether it's new SSL algorithms that need to be incorporated. It gives you high performance. Uh, if you have a GPU, great. If you have a CPU, it works, it works on Collab because we didn't have as much money. We trained it on Collab notebooks. Uh, I think I have more thanks to Google coming in here. here. Uh, but the cool thing is that if you have a serious setup with multiple GPUs, it will scale to that automatically. It uses NVIDIA's DALI uh, to have a very high performance uh, pipeline behind the scenes. And uh, here's an example you can try out today uh, for the self-supervised learner. So here's an example. We're just talking about uh, uh, clustering uh, just a few seconds ago. And uh, we had, and this is an example where we dumped one day of images of a satellite taken by a satellite, ran it through the model, and then this is a TSNE it was able to generate out. And it kind of makes some sense, right? It's more uh, deserty on the left. I think it's more wet on the top and more dry on the bottom hand side. It's more cloudy on the right and. Uh, less cloudy on the left-hand side. So we have these two dimensions going on there. Uh, and you'll also start noticing the names of some of the researchers who were working behind the scenes at the bottom right. Uh, here's another example. If you were more uh, talented and uh, maybe more knowledgeable and you knew how to remove the clouds, so someone did that and uh, they were able to remove the clouds and then build the TSNE out of that. So they removed the clouds, dumped those images, inside the folder, train the model with one line. And what ends up happening is now you start going towards the finer green understanding of those images. Um, that's neat. Here's another example of the raw TSNE of if you had just the clouds and nothing else and how it looks like if we, you know, maybe made it in a slightly more cleaner manner. So the tool works. And when people who are professional scientists dive deeper into this area, they're able to understand, you know, is it making sense or is it just something wrong that got trained in here? So uh, this gives us really good uh, insights in it. Uh, as it so happened while we were working with it, uh, folks who, uh, who work with the Hubble Space Telescope data set also got interested in how this could be applicable there. Uh, so we collaborated with Rick White, who had this nice tool for looking at similarity uh, and TSNEs, and we basically, you know, made it slightly more modular so it can work with any data set. So in this particular example, uh, you can, uh, you know, click on a tool and then, you know, on a model trained with this uh, uh, self-supervised learner and essentially see all its neighbors uh, in this world just by, in a very interactive manner. So that was like pretty neat way of debugging if the model is even working or not. Uh, so I have a question for our host here today. Maybe uh, she'll come back. And the question for her is, 
are these the same category images um they look to be right they look to be yeah look to be but yeah. looks are deceiving because they are not uh here's <laughs> another example let's give it one more try yeah i mean they look to be the same category because i see the um like the code there in both images exactly we as humans re realize what a quote is right even though the colors are totally different yeah uh, but as you now for a model who's training yeah yeah it would be pretty hard yeah uh, here's a good example of uh, i'm i'm going to ask you again is it the same yeah. category yeah it seems like uh, like it's a planned um, area of land so it does seem seem like the same category exactly and sadly again looks are deceiving and that's the point this yeah. is one of the data sets that we have to build up a metrics and benchmarks against mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and it's it's pretty uh, hard and confusing in many ways yeah. uh, and what we are really impressed with uh, was that uh, on this data set called resis45 with 31000 images mm -hmm. we are able to get a pretty decent uh, nearest neighbor similarity performance what that means is that if you take one image at mm -hmm. rank 50 or rank 100 you, the probability of getting another image of the same class yeah. is almost 50% and why i'm more impressed with this is because when we started working on the problem uh, a year before reaching here mm -hmm. we could get to maybe 10% uh, on rank 10 so it took a year to get there and like efforts from many people building on top of each other so i think uh, you can you know all quizzing done here so you can rest <laughs> <laughs> so oh i have the graph here uh, of uh, where we were on the right hand side and where we got to in the left hand side uh, day and night difference another thing i'm really uh, you know happy to mention here is um, rudy uh, who built uh, the self supervised learning tool the tool gives us high gpu performance so if you train a network uh, and you want to become a practitioner it's a skill to train your network with like 90 95% gpu utilization so you really know that you're you're using your resources to highest uh, amount of usage and in this particular case i'm happy that you know with one line you are able to get that whether it's collab uh, or whether it's like a high performing gpu setup so that's neat uh, now that we have done that uh, well uh, now life is going to be pretty simple from this point onwards so you take your data train it you dump the data in a model store then you take all those images and run them through the model so then these images essentially become these embeddings makes sense uh, cuz now we will do our searches on embeddings so now we have somehow stored this in an embedding store and then we need to be able to search them and build an api over it uh, this in itself will be taking a one hour lecture which i'm not going to do and i'm just going to go and give like just a few level highlights so we started uh, on uh, we built this all on google cloud and essentially the tricks we applied there was that whenever you do something when it goes high scale parallelize your downloading and embedding generation so build these modules where uh, in case you know you have a failure you don't have to like re go through all 40 petabytes of data once again it's uh going to be uh, you know in in chunks so dividing and conquering the chunks and i'll show you what our chunks became uh there are a bunch of open source libraries so you know i won't say steal but beg borrow of things that are already out there why reinvent the wheel uh partitioning your data uh by products by day by resolution and i'm going to show an example uh and we had like 30 plus tricks so let me show you a couple of examples So this is an example of uh, nearest neighbor libraries. There's a website called ANN Benchmark, which takes all the uh, libraries out there for uh, nearest neighbor search and benchmarks them. So imagine this: if you wanted to find, okay, I have thousand items, which one of these items is nearest to my current embedding? It's pretty simple. you just have to do euclidean distance between your current item and every other item it's like a subtraction essentially i mean the euclidean formula distance formula pretty simple right but it took you a thousand steps to do that right uh, imagine if this was million if this imagine if this was billion and our data set is around the 10 billion mark here going to be really slow really slow so this is brute force what i mentioned 
But what if there was a way where we could have an approximate nearest neighbor search? And when you go in the approximate search space, you can guarantee 100% correct, but you can kind of guarantee like about 90, 95% recall while getting you know 10,000 x performance. And that's the whole idea. So here are a few libraries out there. Um, and uh, you know there's Annoy from Spotify, four lines of code gets the job done really nice. There's FAISS from Facebook, pretty good too. Uh, and then there's a scan from Google, uh, which is on like this blue curve. Again, nobody paid to tell me Google's name so many times during the presentation today, but it just happened we ended up using these things. Uh, so uh, this was really helpful. And uh, to be clear, <laughs> you start from the very bottom in the right-hand side. Uh, we went with uh, FAISS because SCAN had just come out back then, and uh, we wanted to utilize the GPU performance. Uh, uh, it gives you like 4x faster performance if you have a GPU cluster. So that's how we are looking at Another thing, just to think through modularity, is when you're building things, you want to divide and conquer. So what we did is we took the data and divided it by dates, by the resolution of the image, whether it is a 512 into 512 resolution, 1024 into 1024 resolution, and the satellite product. And so when a search is coming in, we would pick the particular indexes of these embeddings from these libraries and then dynamically serve it to the API. So you don't have to go and search for like billions of images. You are able to give the user a way to constrain their particular search. And that's kind of pretty helpful. Um, so now that we are here, uh, you now build an API over it, uh, and that's great. And then you build uh, a UI over it. So we wanted to make a change to NASA Worldview, which is the website. But just imagine going through the whole cycle of building and doing things. So we said, you know what? It's going to be, uh, spoiler alert, another Google product coming up. Uh, we built a Chrome extension. You know, anybody could uh, put in. And uh, it just makes real-time changes to the NASA UI and puts our search on top of it in a way to show that how a prototype would work and to be able to experiment with it. So this was a, a great way to showcase that things really work uh, without having to really change the code of a full-on NASA system. Uh, and uh, I think I've shown you the demos already. Now we'll go to the real fun parts, okay? So till now, what you have, if this all works, you put in one image, you send it to an API, the API will hopefully return back to you some similar images. And that's great. But these are not exactly correct images always, right? These can be incorrect also. So we need now to convert the results that are coming out into a label, into a label data set. And so we wanted to make labeling easier. And uh, for that, we built uh, the swipe labeler. I like to call this the Tinder for NASA because you basically take a bunch of images drop them in a folder and turn this tool on and basically just sw start swiping left or right. And as you can see in that animation to the left, the images from the unlabeled directory are actually getting into labeled positive, labeled negative. And all you're doing is swiping left and right. Uh, we built it both for your computer, but also for your mobile phone. So you can play with that. Um, but here's where the fun starts. Uh, a researcher who does not have any mobile knowledge or any networking knowledge can run this command on their laptop. And when they run it, they will get a publicly shareable link. So they can go to their friends uh, and contacts, share the network, share the link. And suddenly, people can start crowdsourcing and labeling the data all together. So really come together and do this. Uh, we did a demonstration where we had about 20-ish um, folks in a meeting, and we ran this. And in about 70 to 80 seconds, we are able to label 500 images. Uh, and that's the power of having a good friend network or, or basically going and going into a good Zoom meeting. So yeah, this is pretty neat. Alrighty, so now that we have done all this, we can get the label data and we are feeling good. Now starts the real part, which is, you know what we want? We want catalog quality data sets. Keep in mind, there are 10 billion potential images. 
we started with one image. If you're doing this, what I said so far, maybe you'll get to 30 or 40 uh, labeled images uh, of the kind of thing that you're trying to find, and that's great. But you want to go and find every potential example of a particular phenomenon, right? And that's where, here's a trick. What if, what if we are able to train a classifier and the classifier was able to learn from us on what phenomenon or what kind of things we want to Spotify, spot. Uh, I'm just saying company names for no reason uh, at this point. So what if we train a classifier to actually learn that and then the classifier goes and searches for you. So imagine for the where's Waldo problem, we talked a classifier, what Waldo looks like, and the classifier does the job of going through every image and trying to find it. Sounds about good, right? That's what we'll do with active learning. So uh, similarity search will give us, you know, in a real practical data set, like 30, 40% uh, accuracy. But if you can turn this into a classifier, much, much higher. So what we want to do now is to go and build an active learning uh, system. Because in active learning, you need more less fewer labels to get a great quality classifier out. So let me explain. So let's say we had a small C data set, like a small data set, right? And then you train a machine learning model out of that data set. Then you go and use that model to do a forward pass and generate you know, classification labels uh, on the entire data set. And then anything that is, uh, you know, with uh, like a low probability in classification, that's like kind of, you know, not confident. You pick those uh, uncertain examples and show it to a human. And now when the human sees it, the human will classify those uncertain examples. And then we can add those examples into the label data set. So here's a good example. We start with 100 images, train a classifier. When we do that, we get like 60% F1 score. Okay, okay. And then uh, we take that classifier, which is like okay-ish, run it on the entire data set, uh, and then find what examples is it actually not so confident about. You know, gets like a probability of 0.5, not zero. It's not certain that it's not a hurricane. It's not certain it's a hurricane. It's not one probability, not zero, but like 0.5, right? And then it finds those examples and gives it to a human. And when the human sees it, the human tries to uh, get the it label those data sets, and we start to increase the data set to 200 images, 71 F1 score, go through the whole loop. And now we have 300 images, 78% F1 score. So you're noticing how the machine learning model is getting better and better as we go up. And as that's happening, we reach a point where we say, you know what, this is good enough. Let's run the machine learning model on the data set to find the positive example this time and add it to our data set. Sounds about good. So we did that. Uh, now, fun fact, fun fact. Uh, if you have a classifier which can do 128 images per second, uh, on 10 billion images, it will take you about $30,000 to run one single pass. And it will take you 21,000 hours of time. That's where the scale part comes in. It is big. So for 10 passes, which you'll probably do if you're doing active learning, it will take you $300,000 of data, uh, of money. Uh, and nobody got the money for that, right? Uh, so what we did is we tried to use the problem that I was explaining initially, which is the de-biasing it. What we did is in the simplest way, we took our world of embeddings and try to find embeddings which are equidistant from each other. So what happens is now things that are usually of the same concept clustered together. So now if you try to find things are, which are you know, equidistant in this embedding space, you will usually try to find you know, things that which are like in between. Uh, you find one example of a hurricane and the next example will not be of a hurricane. It will be of something totally different. And when we start doing that and we came up with 10,000 of these uh, fully balanced uh, embeddings, which are equidistant from each other, we came to a representative data set. It's not random. It's uh, a representative data set, which is much better than random. So here's the trick we used. We took this 10 billion space and sampled 100 key items from it. And then we built, uh, uh, we did our forward passes on these 100 key examples. 
And when we find, you know, from these 100K examples, like a few examples which are very uncertain, we then go to our approximate nearest neighbor search engine to say, here's one example of uncertain. Give me 100 other examples which are nearest to it. What I like to call this is, is essentially access to billions of images while having the training cost of pennies because 100K images is like, you know, pretty simple, pretty cheap. Uh, it takes like 30 minutes to do over uh, that. So the, the cool thing here being figure out how to subsample your space in some way and then use the power of the search engine to go on the bigger scale of data. So we had a few examples. We, we surprisingly learned that smaller your data set, less crazy your results are. So here was a data set on 27,000 images. Uh, it would have taken 38 hours for a human to label. When we used our way of doing it, it took like 2.9 hours to do that. Um, so this looks okay. This looks uh, nice and impressive, saves money. All that is great. Uh, but we found that if we tried on a real crazier data set of like Earth, we can do even better. So what we did is we took this example of an island, ran it against the entire Earth, about 5 million potential tiles, and found at the end of this act of learning all images with the probability over 0.5. In 52 minutes, we were able to identify a thousand islands. Again, in 52 minutes, one human was able to identify a thousand islands from a starting from a pretty much a single image. That's uh, pretty impressive. This would have taken $105,000 to do. But with citizen science, you know, this is kind of priceless. Uh, and we're able to get this done for almost free. Uh, now that the pipeline is ending, I'm going to go very quickly to, you know, end the talk and go into questions and answers. Uh, turns out they're across domain applications. I was talking about the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, this was like a great example uh, by Rick Pite and Joshua Peak from Space Telescope Institute. Uh, fun fact, uh, Rick Pite was one of those folks who helped uh, the Hubble Space Telescope in the, eight, in the 80s when the sensor had some configuration issues. He figured out Genius is how to fix it. Uh, this was an example by Jeffrey Smith from the SETI Institute, who uh, keeps coming in New York Times for discovering comments. I gave us, uh, you know, at a conference of speech just like this. I said there's like a one line command. He went in the evening, put images from Voyager and Europa on it, and suddenly this started to make sense uh, in his particular study. Um, I was at a conference recently, and somebody presenting was using the package for space biology. The point is I've never met the person. Uh, and it's just like when you have things in open source, people discover the tools and use it for things that uh, can get them to be more productive. So I think the take home message is basically make things easy for use and the impact will come out. Uh, and as I was talking about the TRL levels, uh, this is starting to get into higher and higher TRL levels uh, for impact. So NASA is building the production version of this right now. And it's just amazing to see, uh, you know, this effort go from an idea to research to deployment. Uh, that's always exciting. But I didn't tell you the best part, the people behind it. So usually, uh, so uh, Frontier Development Labs, which is an AI accelerator for NASA, uh, by the way, if you're looking for internships, uh, you can apply to Frontier Development Labs. It's open right now. Uh, they you know, hire internationally for about eight weeks in the summer. They bring AI uh, folks plus um, science folks together uh, and combine into a team of four to build moonshot projects. And you, know, you get mentored. But usually the folks that get in at the end of the day are, and I'm not discouraging anybody, postdocs, PhDs, and maybe, 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 maybe some few tiny masters, right? So uh, that's uh, generally the makeup of it. So to get a seat to solve some of these problems, especially at NASA, you need to be at the postdoc level, uh, usually. Uh, what if I told you that the problem was actually solved by mostly high school and undergraduate students uh, and a few, few, few masters, right? That would be kind of amazing. And folks who are from Nigeria, Germany, Singapore, India, US, South Korea, Mexico. Uh, and that's exactly the power. Um, so we brought a mentorship system. Uh, we call this Space ML, spaceml.org. You can uh, subscribe to opportunities there. You find those opportunities in space sciences, you know, with NASA, with UK Space Agency and others. 
and try to find, okay, how can we bring some of the who's who from the world of AI and uh, the sciences part together to mentor folks, get them on a path and release things. And usually in about six months time, you know, we try to get, you know, if you have some good work, we put you in front, you go and speak uh, folks in, in front of NASA, give your lectures uh, and work on this. And this turned out to be, uh, when we were at the high, you know, working with the high school students initially, uh, this ended up being one of the five groundbreaking projects in NASA, uh, in AI, uh, among 79 different uh, uh, potential groups within NASA who are also looking uh, to file in that. Uh, so it, it's, it's a good day at the end. So in the as I start to end this, I will quickly say, if my Google Chrome doesn't hang, uh, Okay, it didn't hang. Actually, I just hit in the slides. So that's pretty much what I have, but I'll play a credit slide very shortly uh, as I pick up some other questions. Awesome. Uh, so yes, there are a few questions which I've actually marked for you. Uh, let me go through them. So <clears throat> we have a question from Mike. He asks, what's the best method or steps when developing the ideal pipeline or stack, especially when, when the image data set is so huge? Yeah, so I think, um, first of all, you know, make your bets on uh, how this problem would be solved. By the way, I appreciate the questions being written in big and bold. Uh, <laughs> so um, let me, but we have some, one slide actually running, so I just keep it running yeah. in the background. Awesome, okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Uh, so uh, yeah, what's the best method or steps when developing the pipeline, especially when uh, it's so huge? So I think the question always becomes, how can you divide and conquer? Fun fact, you can't dump 5 million images in a single folder. Uh, it uh, Your Linux system will pretty much uh, you know, hang. Uh, so uh, what I would say is, as you start dividing and conquering, even while you're training the data, start to build those sub uh, you know, fragments uh, that have some commonality. Let's say in satellites, you know, we often would do like the region of Earth that we are downloading or the day, the product, uh, and the resolution of data. Mm -hmm. uh, other things that help is, you know, even when we are making the downloading the data all the way to building the indexes, everything was divided all the way till the very end. So mm -hmm. at no matter, we won't get stuck uh, in doing that. Uh, there are some really good guides on training image scale, ImageNet, or like higher scale things that you can search for, because, uh, you know, these days training for them is pretty has become like a commodity, but you don't want to do it yourself because somebody has you know, figured that out. Other two things I'll really recommend is MLPerf. Um, so there used to be Don Benchmark from Stanford and now there's MLPerf, which is like the, everybody, it's the Olympics of like how to train things, you know, in uh, yeah, faster mm -hmm. uh, at scale, especially at ImageNet. So you have some of those open source guide on how people, you know, train those systems. So yeah. that's a good place to look at. Makes sense, awesome. Uh, I think there's one more question that we have. And for some reason, I am not able to uh, pull that up here. Uh, just give me one second. So I I'm like reading this through uh, LinkedIn. So it's a question by Sanjana, who's asking that for active learning, how can one deal with the incorrect label or, you know, like uh, incorrect labels which are coming with high confidence as these biases would get propagated into the model? And uh, she's asking, did you encounter such issues as well? All the time, all the time. Excellent insight. Uh, so I think for explanation, I said that, you know, one simple way is that you pick things which are like in the middle of uh, probability between zero and one. Zero means it's really confident it's not something. One means it's really confident it is something and somewhere in the middle. Life actually doesn't happen that easily, you know, that middle part. It, it doesn't really, it's not that easy. So what we did is we came up with a few ways where we both take things in the middle as well as things which are like slightly on the confidence side and we would sample them in a bell curve. So it picks more things in the center but it also picks which is confident about so we don't miss out on things. Mm -hmm. um, and while doing that, uh, we were able to pick some of these examples, uh, you know, yeah. yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, now let's 
to like one last question. So um, let me show this on the screen. So Manish is asking that in the nearest neighbor API, how is it giving the output with similar image? Uh, if there is a similarity score with the, all, the, all the images which is stored in the embedding store and calculated every time when an image is given as an input or some other method. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It is calculated every single time. Uh, so the beauty of these uh, approximate nearest neighbor approaches is that it's not going and searching for each and every mm -hmm. uh, you know, embedding. It's basically going through like a tree to find the approximate area which will have mostly similar embeddings. So in summary, we take our images, generate embeddings, and index them through these libraries. Then we take our current image, pass it through the model to come up with the embedding, and then ask our nearest neighbor library, here's an embedding. Give me 100 embeddings which are nearest in Euclidean space. And uh, it's able to do that you know, pretty uh, nicely. Now, you know, obviously, that's simplified. But when we start doing the system design, we have to think about how much space will library A take? Uh, can we break it down or not? Can we? Uh, how much memory requirements? How much disk requirements it will take? Because we'll eventually have to run them, you know, in memory somehow. So yeah. I think as you start digging down into this, uh, uh, in fact, like I, I wrote a book on called Practical Deep Learning for Cloud Mobile and Edge. And mm -hmm. one of those parts was like, how do you go and scale a system from your hello world example all the way to if you had to do it at a bigger place? Makes sense. Totally makes sense. Awesome. Uh, so that's all the questions for today. Like, uh, if you guys have any further questions, I would really appreciate if you can connect with Anirudh. So his email address is again seen on the screen. So you can either connect there or you can also reach out to him through LinkedIn. So either way, he'll be happy to answer all your questions. Uh, um, so thanks a lot, Anirudh. Like this was this was awesome. Uh, thank you so much for being here and you know sharing your insightful thoughts. Uh, I would really uh, appreciate if you can share the slide decks with me so that I can add that to the description of the video once it goes on YouTube later on, and uh, you guys can access it there. And um, yes, uh, like it'll pro pro have everything that you saw today. It'll also have Anirudh's contact, so you can reach out to him. I'm going to just give one shout out that uh, uh, in spaceml.org, if you go bottom of the page and subscribe to the newsletter, some of these opportunities keep opening up. And uh, it would be great if you get to know when some opportunity is opening. So thanks, okay. everyone. And awesome. you have a great day. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Anirudh. And yes, I have added the spaceml.org link uh, into the comments. So if anybody is interested, they can go uh, have a look there. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, so we have our next um, next uh, speaker. So before that, let me just quickly go through the tri trivia question. Uh, this trivia question is similar to what we had yesterday and day before. So uh, I'm going to ask you a question which has four options. Uh, it's either A, B, C, or D. Put that in the chat of your LinkedIn comments. Uh, the first person to answer correctly will be getting the be Between the Spreadsheets book by Susan Walsh. Um, so if you are tuning in from YouTube, make sure you're, uh, you're going on LinkedIn and then answering the questions. That's how I know who you are and I can send you the book. So awesome. Uh, without wasting much of a time, here's the question. So the question says, principal component analysis or PCA belongs to which category? Is it supervised learning? Is it reinforcement learning? Is it semi-supervised learning? Or is it unsupervised learning? So I'm going to give you 10 seconds to answer. And uh, we're going to see who's the fastest person here. Awesome. Just put in A, B, C, or D based on your answer. And I'm going to see who's the person uh, answering the question correctly and the fastest. Okay, so the answer here is unsupervised learning. So principal component analysis is a type of dimensionality reduction algorithm which comes under the category of unsupervised learning. So thank you so much for participating in the trivia. And uh, I don't want to waste too much of our time for the next speaker. So I'm going to invite her here. And uh, I'm going to re uh, reveal the result of the trivia later uh, during the conference. So uh, I'm very happy and excited to um, to introduce Anna. Hi, Anna. 
uh, can you hear me? Uh, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> hi, hi. Happy hi. to be here. It's it's awesome to have you here, and uh, it's one of the very rare occasions when you know uh, I come across people who are working from the AI governance or AI policy perspective, uh, because most of the people I interact with or we have here are uh, from the tech side of things, and I follow your content on on LinkedIn, and it's it's really amazing to see your work that you're doing uh, with AI governance and ethics. So uh, I'm I'm really glad to have you here. Thanks, thanks. So for me, it's a little bit other other way around. I have people around me who work on AI ethics and governance, so <laughs> I always look for technical perspective too. Awesome. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. So I will I will try to share my experience here right now. Uh, but I just uh, pro I I kind of assume that just like you mentioned, the people who are attending attending this conference are also pretty tech focused. Mm -hmm. um so i i did kind of intro introductory um presentation and also explain what i'm what i'm doing and mm -hmm. i thought probably i i should kind of shorten uh, shorten the presentation of myself and then follow up the questions in a chat if there is if there is people who have priority on a specific topic and they can like please mm -hmm. attend this uh, ask your questions and we'll focus on that more rather than a uh, general overview of the topic Yes, absolutely. Thanks a lot for uh, for introducing that, Anna. So uh, just a quick introduction about Anna here. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of Adlan AI, which is uh, focusing on AI governance, policy and ethics consulting. And uh, she is a very ardent uh, advocate for AI ethics, and she writes a lot about uh, in, in the similar space. So if you have uh, any more questions or like you want to follow her work, please do that uh, using the link that I'm going to share. So I'm going to put her uh, profile link on the chat so you can connect with her. Awesome. And as Anna mentioned, please feel free to put in your questions in the chat while we uh, while we are conducting the session. Uh, we'll be taking a pause after like every seven to eight minutes to go through the questions and answer them through the session and not not have it through the end of the end of the session. So it's more interactive and uh, you guys can get your questions answered uh, more more frequently. So uh, yeah, without much ado, let's let's jump into the session, Anna. Okay, so I should share my screen, right? Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Give me a second. No worries. In the meantime, what I can do is I can check on who's the winner for trivia. Okay, awesome. We have it here. We have it here, okay. Anna. Cool. Um, Do you mind putting that on the uh, on full screen or like slide share? Yes. Yeah. This is too much full screen. What? Sorry. No worries. I'm good. <laughs> okay, whatever. Um, like this way, I cannot see anything else on the screen. But anyway, no, that, that's that's fine. Uh, I I think mm -hmm. we can we can see you as well as the screen. Uh, it would be great if you can just uh, put your slide on a slideshow so that it's visible on the full screen. Is it? Isn't it? No, it's not. I visible. did already. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's not visible on full screen. Oh, that's weird because for me it is there's nothing else on the screen oh interesting uh uh can you try with like mm -hmm. slideshow i did hmm it's interesting uh can somebody confirm on the uh -huh. comment if they're able to see the screen see the uh text clearly then we can move uh, ahead with the same format I think probably there is a lag on internet. I don't know. Hmm. Let's check. Add. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think the screen is visible. Uh, and now we can go ahead. 
Okay. Yeah, I don't know why why does it do it, but okay. What no worries. I think like people have confirmed that they can see the text clearly, so we're good. Okay. Um so as as mentioned already, um I will I will talk about I will talk today about implementing AI governance framework and why is it uh, right time to do it now. And I will discuss it in terms of AI ethics in three dimensions, that is ethics of data, algorithm and usage. So I will just very briefly uh, start with why this topic is very important. Uh, we've seen like if, if, if you talked about this topic, AI governance or AI regulation or AI ethics about like three, four years ago, um, very few people will, would pay attention to your your talk and what you're talking about. So, and they probably would kind of laugh at you. Uh, but in the last couple of years, especially in the last two years, actually, um, more and more organizations have started to, to discuss these topics and has worked on it uh, very, very actively. And more and more people um, getting awareness around it, including technology organizations, including non-profit non organizations, or whether it's a governmental organizations. So uh, as a result, then we have 700 policy initiatives around the world, according to OECD. And also more and more companies are already spending uh, millions of um, euros or dollars in lobbying uh, to support their technology, uh, technology companies. And we've seen uh, in the EU, for example, because um, I, I'm, I'm more focused in, in the EU um, in the first place, um, there is almost 100 million euros spent in lobbying annually. And tech has become the biggest lobby sector by spending ahead of pharma, fossil fuels, finance or chemicals. And we are also seeing hundreds of new entities being formed around the world. And uh, this, uh, you, you can check this, all, all of these organizations, the database, um, and all tech is human, if you've heard of this organization, has created an, an amazing database for these organizations. I have actually contributed to that. Um, so we can check it on their website. I can also uh, link this in comments. Uh, so basically why so many companies and so many organizations are talking about this is because uh, we have several challenges out there. Uh, first, a very important challenge would be that um, this technology uh, development and technology acceptance is uh, being happening on a very accelerated pace and the regulators and policymakers or even um, the eth ethicists to say so um, find it very hard to catch up with these developments. So this kind of accelerated pace requires really also accelerated pace of um, the ways to govern these technologies to for better quality, for better uh, impact and for um, for um, benefit of, of the greater society. Um, a second biggest challenge is uh, is the public trust, and uh, I, I'm I'm actually start to think about it in a way. Um, for example, it, it, the COVID COVID uh, whole whole COVID situation, I think has uh, kind of showed how trust pl uh, plays a very very important role when uh, we are bringing something new on the market and in the whole society. And I think um, the vaccine has been, for example, very very good um, way to see how trust is important. If you do not get um, trust, higher levels of trust in a society, then you will kind of get uh, get a pushback as a company from, from the society, and then it will be harder to implement this, uh, your new um, suggestion on the market. And in, in terms of AI, the public has already seen a lot of um, like failures or accidents on, uh, on the market that has been happening already. Uh, and we are seeing that um, already a lot. I will um, show also a couple of examples later. And we have challenge three um, that I also touched a little bit earlier, AI specific regulations uh, that we do not yet have in place, but we have other regulations that can be applied to artificial intelligence um, deployment uh, in specific use cases. So it's it's becoming kind of 
gray area where companies find it really difficult to understand and to how to comply and how to uh, follow follow these rules and not to end up in in a difficult situation uh, on, on a legal level as well. Um, so. In accordance to these major challenges, um, then I'm moving to discuss this in the three dimensions uh, that I have mentioned. Uh, so this ethics or what we call ethics, or if, if you want to call it like responsible AI that, that we hear a lot, um, or uh, any terms that are emerging right now, I think it's, I kind of uh, find it easier to justify now to uh, the use of different kind of terms, because uh, so far we do not have a specific definitions of the terms, but um, like recently I find it a little bit um, confusing to use this term uh, responsible AI, uh, but that's a little bit different topic. So um, to follow on that, uh, we have data ethics, algorithm ethics and also usage ethics, or um, if you would like to call it ethics of practice. And I will go through this uh, briefly about each of them. Um, so um, I, I will not explain this uh, all in details, what all of these terms mean, because I assume that the audience already have the awareness of this, uh, this audience. Uh, so just uh, to, to highlight some of uh, the most important terms here in data ethics, usually what we talk about is informed consent, privacy, uh, bias in the data itself, data accuracy, uh, data ownership, like who owns the data, whether it's a private company or whether it's government, um, and also the transparency, how data is used. And then we have um, this couple of questions, the major questions that we might ask while we are developing, while we are collecting data, analyzing this data, and also um, inputting this data in the algorithmic training. And the questions, uh, for example, that we have, how to document the data used for the algorithm training, and also how to notify users about how their data is used. Because, uh, for example, we are seeing very difficult this inform the execution of informed consent. Um, when you when when you enter the website, everyone already knows, and I've I've seen a lot of complaints already exactly um, recently uh, that you have to approve the. Um, approve the cookies, the consent, the use of the cookies by the website, which is also becoming very um, annoying for the website users. And I think uh, there is already high time that policymakers start to um, change change this uh, kind of uh, implementation of this informed consent. Then we have other potential questions like how data is labeled and by whom and by what kind of bias might be including included in the data. And we also have what risks might arise from biased data and how to mitigate them, um, like whether we uh, whether um, we can, as a human, find causations in the data and um, like use use features in a way that is re rela reliable in the training, and also uh, yeah whether is whether labeling is appropriate to the case and what kind of limitations it has. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure if you all have seen this uh, example uh, of Google Translate, so it is translation from, uh, from the uh, Hungarian language which doesn't, ha which doesn't have the gender specific pronouns. Um, so um, the Google Translate has translated this into English in a way that uh, reflects um, our so societal stereotypes about gender um, issues. So because it's she's an ours, and he's a CEO, for example. Um, and I think the, the Google has already um, remedied this issue. Then we have algorithmic ethics. Um, here we usually discuss security and safety of, of the algorithms, um, and especially in a, in a physical, um, physical environment. Uh, we also discuss exp explainability, transparency, uh, trust and accountability. And here we also have a lot of questions to, to ask before we deploy AI um, algorithm here. And uh, we have, for example, whether uh, the algorithmic decision making process is explainable and um, is the predictions accurate? Um, like how to, um, how to protect AI models from malicious attacks and how to protect users from harm. 
and also um, how to explain the decisions from uh, from the algorithm that has been made. Well, actually, this is um, a lot more technical question rather than ethical question, but um, in, in a sense that, um, in a sense, if we explain this in terms of a causality, causality versus corre uh, correlation, um, then we will also end up uh, with ethical um, dimension of explainability. Um, also, we have question how to build real robust uh, robust AI models and how to like build more sustainable models um, and how to evaluate them before deployment, evaluate uh, against the risk, uh, specific risk metrics and or uh, accuracy and how to monitor its uh, performance. Um, and usually the bias that are coming, um, the, the specific reason, reasons of a bias, what we see is in data, either in data or in algorithm, or the major and major sub reason for that is usually causation and um, causation versus correlation problem. Um, so I, I usually like to hear uh, to bring here one good example about causation and correlation there, which has happened in real real world. But if it have time in the end, probably uh, we can discuss this later. If if someone is wondering, feel free to ask in comments. Um, but I also like to discuss this uh, example, a level algorithm, which happened happened in UK. Um, and so basically, if if you are aware of, of the case, um, here we have uh, the algorithm that made the decision for the student during during the COVID time where where the schools were not able to to hold the exams. So algorithm may, made the predictions for the students what kind of um, mark they would get in in the exam. So, but it ended up expectedly. Um, that students found uh, the algorithmic decision unfair and they protested and the protest also moved in the streets. Um, so usually what I, how I reflect on that and why it happened is that incompetence took place, um, purpose and the context of the technology was not well thought after and also various actors who were engaged in the development of this algorithm have not been um, ha did not consult with, um, for example, external uh, experts um, and adequate impact assessment has not been conducted. And um, the reason um, that this organization has been naming so far is that there is lack of best practice examples and standards. And I, I kind of agree with them, of course, uh, they, they can justify themselves with this um, problem. Uh, what happened? Um, impact. One team with zero decision makers affected the future of thousands of students. And that's why it's important to really be care careful what, when you're building the algorithm. Um, just because you, you have impact, you may have impact on not on your users and on the environment around. Also, it's about reputation. Uh, it's not only about your goodwill, but also your reputation. It's public trust in government, in company, and the technology diminished um, the organizations that has built this algorithm and also project manager resigned. So um, this has been very um, obvious example uh, why companies should care about AI governance questions and AI ethical questions. And here we have a couple of other examples that I'm sure everyone, almost everyone probably have, have heard here that Amazon, um, Amazon's um, algorithm um, discriminated, discriminated against women. Um, like here is also a level algorithm. We have heard George Floyd case where um, policies of uh, facial recognition system are discriminated against race. And we have we see here the statistics of how facial recognition technologies are um, biased against um, some some specific features. And also very briefly here, we have usage ethics. And I usually like to bring here the healthcare example, which makes it easiest uh, to understand uh, because in, in healthcare, we have um, AI enabled machines, which are used by the, by, by doctors. So um, there you already have the question, ethical question 
um, when it comes to doctors. So how how they should use these technologies? They are not so how much to trust um, the the machine, the AI machine, the decision of the machine, how much, how, when not to trust the machine and when to trust themselves, for example, and what kind of uh, skills they should have in place in order to be able to make these uh, decisions. Um, but one good example here, uh, real world use case example uh, that I like is uh, this te Tesla example um, where people caught the drivers of Tesla um, being asleep while they should have been driving. So while the car was driving, but uh, the drivers were asleep. So this is also the ethics of usage. The user users themselves um, have can whether it's end user or whether it's kind of mid middle user like doctors, they also have their own responsibility how they use these technologies. And. Um, so here, um, uh, here I explain uh, the solutions which, uh, which I endorse and uh, we have built also at at AI. Uh, we have the uh, we have the AI governance framework uh, that we call we call AI AI governance box, and uh, this is kind of framework to think within and outside of the box. Basically, um, the part where uh, where we give um, the the least fit for purpose and data quality and so on. This is the box, which we provide as, as a fixed solution for the companies, but of, of course they apply to a specific use case or the industry, but the place where companies have to think outside of the box is uh, this on top ethical principles and policies, uh, which will highly depend on the values and culture of the company. Um, which they will have to communicate to their users and not only users, but also to their uh, um, to, to, the, to the managers and to their teams. So basically this is kind of um, kind of thing where companies really need to uh, be open-minded and think about um, ethical principles or, uh, or the dimensions, whether you call it responsible AI dimensions, um, in, a, in a way that could be um, applied in long, long term, in a foreseeable way, um, and also can reflect the values of the company. Um, but of course, the principles are not enough. Um, in the last two years, we have seen uh, that tons, a lot of companies have developed the tons of frameworks, guidelines, and policy papers, and white papers, and so there is a, a really a lot of them. So now, now what industry has to do is to move uh, from what stage to how stage. And here we have um, also where you see the triangle. Um, we have different steps to take um, in the how stage, whether it's structural, procedural, or relational stage, um, relational um, steps. And all of these steps the companies are advised to follow like from very, very beginning of the AI development stage. It's from proof of concept stage and design and dev development and also deployment stage where uh, the companies already uh, check how how actually algorithms work in real life scenarios. So, um, yeah, I think I will finish here. Um, if you have any specific question regarding um, this slide, how this works in practice and so on, feel free to ask in the chat or any other question that is related to my previous to my previous um, statements. So feel free to ask and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, feel free to also contact me via LinkedIn or email that is given here. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Anna. Uh, so yes, we do have some questions here. So uh, let me go through them and read them. So uh, Mike asks, is that uh, interesting presentation? So he's saying that with uh, EU or uh, USAI regulations on the horizon, how can you plan this? So he, what he's asking is, um, will everyone need to update their existing algorithms, right? So a lot of the principles that you mentioned, right? Uh, those are giving a good framework on how companies can build new algorithms or like, you know, what they should follow when they are building a new algorithm. 
But what about the ones which they already have in place? Let's say a company is running any data science models for the past five years. And uh, how do they update or how do they plan to make sure that the existing algorithms are compliant to all, all the uh, AI principles that you mentioned? Yeah, that, uh, that's, yeah, that's exactly very, um like kind of complicated thing for the companies to do. And that's where I exactly see um, the interest for from the companies uh, coming, for example, for such uh, services uh, where um, we we are able to actually provide some kind of um, guide, some uh, some kind of update or forecasting on on the policy discussion. So uh, right now, for example, um, e European Union has proposed the draft AI um, AI Act in the last year, April, uh, but it's not going to probably be enforced within three or four years, probably, if we look at a GDPR enforcement uh, timeline, for example. So it is very hard for the companies to, to um, think about what might come into effect after four years and how to plan their uh, AI development stage. Um, uh, but what the companies can, can really do in this case is to, uh, the best thing actually companies can do is to really very, very closely follow up to the discussions on a, um, AI policy making to get really updated and like um, have kind of internal insight to um to to all the discussions that is happening on a policy policy side from high level uh, high level discussions from european policy european or united states um high level policy makers um and like to to get some kind of um prognosis what might happen on the market so basically that that's the best thing um they can they can do and another thing is that um, so looking at the guidelines and looking at the policy insight right now, uh, I think companies can really get insights, uh, what are possible values mm -hmm. and possible human right dimensions that the policymakers might include in these regulatory documents. So they can already build um, their algorithm uh, with cons considering um, this kind of overview of existing um, regulations or policy papers that are already um, like out there on the market. Uh, so this this could be their best best guidance right now. Got it. That that totally makes sense. Um, so another thing uh, that Mike is asking is when we are using uh, like there's a lot of like data governance companies, right? Like so one of the example he gave is something called fairly.ai so he's asking like such kind of companies is uh, how how um, accountable uh, would it be if organizations are like you know taking consulting services from such companies to ensure uh, with their ai principles well um it always depends on on like partnership how how on what kind of um, terms you agree on before before you partner with any kind of consulting company. If 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 I understand the question correctly, I don't know. Um, yeah. So if if it is about third party, um, like taking third party service, and whether this third party can provide your um, can provide security or anything, uh, that's exactly where companies should really go for into details. Yeah. And also whether uh, this third party service can um, can be can com comply to your um, values, ethical values. That's also something to really look into before you um, confirm partnerships. So it totally depends because um, if if you see uh, the European Union white paper for example I did not see that in United States uh, regulatory um, um, initiative so far uh, but in European Union white white paper they are uh, possibly planning to also guide and rule third party relations too okay. so you cannot you cannot just say that sorry it was third party we did not know <laughs> what they were up to so yeah, yeah it's that, that always totally sense. that that totally makes sense so one of the other things anna is coming from like a data utility versus like data privacy perspective right uh companies on one hand would say that um 
um you know like we are making business by giving you personalization like we need to collect your data to give you better results right like to give you better personalization to give you better recommendations be it from ads or like you know better search results etc so there's a trade off that we see that uh, companies do need data to give you the best services, whereas we are also talking about data privacy. So in that scenario, one of the technologies that has prominently come out is federated learning, where we say that, you know, we're going to train the models on the devices. Uh, but this is, again, like there's a lot of uh, bottlenecks when it comes to federated learning as well, right? Uh, because not all models, not all technology is directly can directly be connected from devices, right? So there's a lot of algorithms which are built by data that has to be collected uh, like in a batch manner or, you know, like uh, in a different form rather than collecting them from like, say a mobile phone, right? So for models which are probably like Google Maps or, you know, like, uh, like Google Keyboard, et cetera. So those kind of things can be collected using federated learning, but not all uh, possible models. So what do you suggest uh, as a solution here? Because companies do have to run their businesses, right? So how do we, how do they make sure that, um, that, you know, like privacy is still, uh, still like an, an option for the users to either like opt out and they are still like running their business here? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> that's that's uh, okay. That's a huge question. And right right here, I do not promise that I have an ultimate answer to that. No. <laughs> and I don't think uh, so far it um, it exists that the answer exists exists that uh, can equally um, be um, kind of liked by companies and by users um, at the same time. Uh, but what what I usually think is uh, first of all. Uh, and I also mentioned about the trust. First, first of all, companies need to um, gain the trust of the users that if users opt out, they are really opt out because you know there is there are still doubt uh, from the users that even if the, if I opt out, um, the will the company still uh, follow my data, record my data? Is it really an opt out or not? This is the first uh, doubt that the com the companies need to um, kind of kind of dissolve um, in the users. Uh, the second thing is that um, exactly like uh, giving users um, the possibility to opt out is one solution out there. But for those who want to use the service and opt in, um, like the companies still. Uh, still kind of have this responsibility to uh, care about the privacy of the user. It doesn't, um, giving the consent to use the data does not mean that companies are, uh, you enable the companies that your data to be used um, in, in any manner. Um, another difficulty and what companies need to really reflect on is the communicating, um, easy communication of their data using practices to the user. So the more complicated the companies make their data use practice, the, the less trust they will have from the user because the user will never need the data, will never read the data privacy um, policies. And also uh, they will always have doubts how uh, the data is used. So these are just a um, couple of um, explanations or solutions that comes to my mind. But on um, and I, I, I'm not the very precise person to answer that to on 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 a technical level, uh, but on the uh, user user com company communication level, that's um, how um, I see it and how it should work. Yeah. Um, so it's it's always about trust, building the trust in the user and also in policymakers, not only users, mm -hmm. and uh, in the community um, and public in general. That that totally makes sense. Um, and one of the other things I, I think I had. I have read this kind of an argument uh, somewhere while uh, reading some material about AI ethics. So one of the things I had read, and I wanted your opinion on this, uh, is that uh, somebody had mentioned that, you know, when we look at real world data set, right, be it resumes, uh, like resume shortlisting or like credit approval or something, right? Like there are biases that exist right like there is there is societal biases that exist and that's that's the truth right like there are biases that currently exist and when we are using that data to build any models that biases does get reflected into the models right 
so what we are trying to do here by debiasing or like you know making sure that um, that that uh, the models are fair somewhere we are trying to create this alternate reality where we are saying that the world is ideal or like you know the reality is ideal but it is not right so what is your opinion on on that like um, because by doing these methodologies we are trying to create an alternate reality so what is your opinion on that to you know like uh, use a data that's uh, that's probably reflecting the reality of the current society and uh, building a model that's reflecting not non reality or like an ideal world yeah um yeah actually that's uh, that's the question i have uh, been also discussing uh, some time so basically um first and also what i meant in when when I showed the governance framework, the first very first sentence where there was fit for purpose. Yeah. Uh, so basically, the the first question that we've got to ask about AI algorithms usually, uh, no matter what kind of use case it is, uh, what kind of and whether it is use case or generally what we are asking from these technologies is to ask like what we really want from from this algorithm, what we really want from this uh, AI technology. So. Uh, Basically, uh, do the question here we should ask is do we do we want the technology that um, makes the decision much better than human or do we want technology that makes the decision just like humans, um, just like human intellect? So um, if unless uh, unless actually we answer this question, it is really hard to also go go through and uh, answer your question too. So. Uh, just if if we, for example, assume that we need intellect and decision making process and decision making that is human level, mm -hmm. then we should say that uh, we want the kind of bias um, that human decision making makes to be reflecting reflected in the algorithm. But that means we should work not on improving the algorithm, but improving the human decision making first and then <laughs> improving the algorithm uh, decision making second. Uh, yeah. But because uh, we want, but if we want to, uh, if we want uh, the algorithm to be better decision maker than the human and in better, we mean the unbiased. So basically here we should, um, we should uh, try to, I mean, probably there is nothing in that, but it's kind of go to kind of a philosophical uh, warm <laughs> uh, rabbit holes goes down uh, there. So basically, if we want to have some kind of uh, better than uh, human level decision making, uh, completely free from bias, I think uh, then here we go with different kind of technological solutions, debiasing, and also the da uh, data uh, data analysis, and where uh, where you try um, your best, for example, to um, to kind of anonymize uh, the data features that are uh, that can um, can take you to the specific uh, feature like gender or ethnicity. Um, that can point out to there or um, like somehow to neutralize the data. So all, all, all these techniques uh, you, you can use and you can uh, expect your best best result. Uh, but first of all, um, so basically this is the first question you would like to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's not only the algorithm. Um, I'm not sure if I'm making myself clear, but it's not only algorithmic problem when you look at it yeah. right yeah. now. It's also a um, human problem and we should work on both like human problem and algorithm problem. And I think we are already working on both. I see a lot of changes um, around the world there on um, a lot of topics. So basically, um, yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, Anna, is there any recommended uh, resources which you can share with me? Uh, I will be adding that to the uh, to the description of the video later on when I'm sharing uh, the conference session. So if you can share the deck that you uh, that you presented today, along with like any reading material, which uh, which would be relevant to the audience, that'll be great. Yeah, um, yeah, I sh uh, I can share a lot of resources actually that I have like books or oh. articles or papers or mm -hmm. just let me know also my presentation. Awesome, awesome, that's great. Yeah, that'll be very helpful. And uh, that's probably all the questions that we had. Um, thanks a lot, Anna. Like, thank you so much for taking out time. Thanks. And I know it's uh, pretty late in the evening for you. So I really appreciate you accommodating uh, the session um, in your day. Sure. 
uh, it was very, very uh, in, in informative to talk to you. Thanks for inviting. Um, I was happy to be able to share this with the audience. I hope you find it interesting or insightful. Yeah, thanks a lot. It was it was definitely very insightful. And I have shared your uh, link LinkedIn uh, profile link on the comments. So if people won't want to connect, please feel free to connect with Anna. And uh, yes, I will be sharing her contact details in the description of the video as well when we are posting it on YouTube. So similar to all other speakers, we will be having her uh, uh, connection details as well. So you can connect with her and ask any further questions if you have so. Um, awesome. Thanks a lot, Anna. It was it was great chatting. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye. OK, awesome. So as we are wrapping up um, today's conference, I would like to say that today's uh, trivia winner is Shubham Gupta, and he will be receiving one copy of uh, Build, uh, Between the Spare Trees by Susan Walsh. So congratulations, Shubham. And uh, yeah, that's that pretty much concludes our session for today. Please uh, join us for tomorrow as well. Tomorrow will be the last and the fourth day of the conference, and we'll be having two more sessions tomorrow, along with the trivia questions similar to what we had today. So tomorrow is again a chance for you to win Between the Spreadsheets book. So uh, make sure you're tuned in tomorrow at 8 a.m. PT. That'll be uh, 9.30 p.m. IST and uh, 4 p.m. GMT. So make sure you're tuned in. We will be again having the live conference tomorrow. Thank you so much. And